Okay, so we, uh, we will consider today uh, solutions of some problems related to uh, the law of conservation of momentum. And the first problem I would like to consider is a zero-level problem from your syllabus. Uh, problem number five zero. Five zero. It says a rocket with mass AM six tons. Six tons. is set to launch vertically. Find the fuel consumption required to provide sufficient thrust to give the rocket initial acceleration A equals 2 G. Two times the acceleration of free fall upwards if gas velocity with respect to the rocket is U is given as three kilometers per second. Uh, three kilometers per second. So what happens here? We have a rocket which is set to, to fly vertically. And uh, there is a launching pad here, and the rocket is ready to, to start. And when the engine starts, gas flows out of the combustion chamber with velocity u, three kilometers per second, with respect to the, to the rocket. And the rocket, by, by the statement of this problem, must go up with acceleration A, two times the acceleration of free fall, certainly with respect to the ground. This acceleration is measured with respect to the Earth. So, this acceleration is a vector, and this velocity is a vector, and there is a force acting on the rocket a force of gravity which is also a vector and which we know is mg is a vector g is acceleration of free fall directed downward on the last lecture on the previous lecture we have derived a Mischerski equation which defines the acceleration of the rocket of any any object moving while its mass is changing so the Mischewski equation has the form the mass of the rocket well uh, it was denoted as capital M the mass of the rocket capital M dv by dt equals the vector of external force, the vector of net external force, that is the sum of all external forces acting on the rocket, minus vector u and the rate of fuel consumption the rate of fuel consumption, mu. Mu is just the quantity we have to find in this problem. The rate of fuel consumption, which is needed for this rocket to accelerate upward with a given acceleration 2g. What rate of human consumption? How many kilograms per second of fuel should be spent here, should be burned, so that the rocket goes upward with such a given acceleration. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this equation is intuitively uh, understandable on intuitive level. Suppose there is no fuel consumption, so mu equals zero. Then this term is absent. And then we obtain just uh, the second Newton's law. And the acceleration will be directed just uh, along the external, uh, the net external force. That's natural, like in second Newton's law. If the external force is zero, then this is another situation, external force is zero, then we have only fuel consumption, uh, fuel uh, rate of fuel consumption and the velocity of, uh, of gas. And the velocity of gas is directed here and downward and minus this vector will be directed upward and the acceleration will be directed upward if there is no external force. Everything is clear, everything is natural, understandable. So, uh, some you will find sometimes plus sign here in some books. What's the matter? This is unnatural. It means that acceleration of the rocket has the same direction as the gases, that is, downward if there are no forces. But if you find this, the plus sign here, look at this quantity, it's defined in different way. We define mu as uh, that, that is mu, mu uh, dot, certainly, that was my mistake. I've forgotten to put the dot here. That is the uh, time derivative. That is d mu by dt. Mu is the amount of fuel which is spent. How many kilograms of fuel per second is spent by the rocket engine? But in some books, they define it as the change of mass of the rocket. Uh, because if the rocket spent, for example, 25 kilograms of fuel per second, it means that the mass of the rocket diminished by 25 kilograms. So the mass of the fuel will be positive, dm will be positive, but the change of mass of the rocket will be negative. So there are two possible ways to, de to determine this uh, quantity, this coefficient. And uh, this is practically the same, just, just minus sign will appear here because we may, de we may define this quantity as the loss of rocket's mass due to fuel consumption. Or we may define this uh, quantity as the positive number of kilograms, positive uh, amount of mass of fuel spent per second. So these are just the same. This is the same quantity, but just with different sign. And so if we define this quantity in different way, then we will obtain here plus sign. Uh, don't be surprised. There are two possible ways to, find, to, to write this equation because there are two possible ways to define this quantity. In some books, you will find, uh, you will see plus sign here. In other books, minus sign here. Well, if we put minus sign, then nu is positive. And this is just a number of kilograms per second of fuel. Kilograms of fuel spent every second. So we must find this quantity, uh, uh, consumption of fuel, such that the rocket will accelerate upward with acceleration 2g. How can it be found? We know that F is the gravity force acting on the rocket. So F equals m g. G is the vector directed downward. This is acceleration of free fall, downward to the ground, to the earth, to the center of the earth. So this quantity is known. This quantity is known. It's given. This is just the quant this is just the acceleration of the rocket. It's given in our statement of the problem. The mass is given. The velocity of gas is given. So everything is given, and we may easily solve this equation and find uh, 
this rate of fuel consumption. So just solve this equation and we have u mu dot will equal to f minus m a In order to solve this equation, I have to choose the positive direction, the positive direction in space, let it be upwards. And I have to go from vector form of this equation to a scalar form. In the scalar form, vector u, the velocity of gas, will be directed downwards, so it will be negative negative u mu dot equals the force will be negative minus mg and acceleration will be positive so the sign will not change here the sign will not change here well in this case okay I multiply by minus one and immediately obtain for mu dot the solution to this problem which will be m g plus a divided by u. Mass of the rocket six tons. Ton is not the basic unit in international systems. Ton is, should be converted to kilograms, that is 6,000 kilograms as the mass of the rocket g plus a, a equals 2g, so this is 2g, and we have 3g if I take g like 10 meters per second squared, and divided by u, which is 3 kilometers per second. Kilometer is also, as I told you, not some ba basic unit, and we should convert everything to the basic units. So 3 kilometers per second will be 3,000 meters per second. First of all, look at the units of measurement. Kilograms will remain on its place, meters will be cancelled, and one second will also be cancelled. So what remains here will be kilograms per second, just what we need. How many kilograms of fuel is spent per second? Well, calculating is maybe cancelled, Three will be cancelled, 1,000 may be cancelled, and what remains here, six times 10, 60 kilograms per second, about 60 kilograms, because I have taken G, an approximate value for G, I have taken G as equal to 10 meters. If you take it 9.8, you will get here something like 59 kilograms or 58 something like that. Uh, so about 60 kilograms per second of fuel should be spent so that such a rocket goes up with acceleration of 2g. What if I don't want this rocket to accelerate upward, I want it just to stay and to, to just to hang in the air at rest and don't move. The engine is working, the rocket engine works, and the rocket does not accelerate, it just hangs in the air. In this case, acceleration A will be zero, and this formula will give you three times smaller consumption of fuel, just 20 kilograms per second needed for the rocket to hang and don't not accelerate, neither upward nor downward. If you diminish the consumption, the rocket will go down with acceleration. If you increase the consumption of fuel, the rocket will go up. The larger the fuel consumption, the larger will be the acceleration A of the rocket. Any questions?
Everything's clear. Okay. Next, we will consider problem number one point one six six from Irodov. A particle of mass one gram. Moving with velocity v1 given as three unit vector i minus two unit vector j experiences a perfectly inelastic collision with another particle of mass two, another particle, so that was the first particle m1 and now we have particle m2 of mass two grams and which was moving with the velocity v2 equal to four unit vector j minus six unit vector k. Find the velocity of the formed particle, both the vector v and its modulus. If the components of the vectors v1 and v2 are given in the SI units. So this should be considered uh, in SI unit. So three in SI unit is what? Three meters per second. And here two meters per second. And unit vectors give us the direction along the x axis, y axis, and k along z axis. So what we know is that the velocity v1 is expressed through a unit vector which is directed along the x axis and another unit vector directed along the y axis. It means that this velocity v1 belongs to xy plane, the xy plane, for example, the plane of this wall. And vector v belongs to another plane, yz plane, because it's expressed in this in other two vectors, one belonging to y direction and k belonging to k direction, k along this uh, wall. So uh, second velocity belongs to this plane, to this wall. The first, first velocity somewhere directed along this plane and the second velocity along this plane. So in the space, in this three-dimensional space, these two vectors are directed somewhat non-trivially, it's not very simple to imagine. So we have to solve this problem mathematically, basing, on, basing our solution on physics laws. What do we have to find in this problem? What's the equation? Uh, find the velocity of the formed particle, yes, if the uh, collision was perfectly inelastic. Find the velocity uh, of the formed particle, both the vector form and modulus, and in modu velocity, the modulus and vector. So the two particles collided in a perfectly inelastic collision. You know that in inelastic collision, the particles stick together and their kinetic energy, the part of the kinetic energy is lost and spent on heating. But we don't need kinetic energy, we need momentum. And the momentum is conserved in this process, in inelastic collision. Why? Because we proved a theorem on the motion of the center of mass of a closed system. 
In this particular case, closed system consists of two particles which interact only between each other and no other bodies influence the behavior of these particles. There is no interaction of these particles with the external world. So these two particles composite a closed system. The, the only interaction is between these two particles, that is the internal interaction inside this closed system. And therefore, uh, the law of conservation of momentum holds for this system. Conservation of momentum means that the initial momentum, the vector of initial momentum, should equal to the vector of final momentum. Initial momentum is the momentum of the particles before collision, and final momentum uh, is the momentum of two particles after collision. Before collision, the momentum was m1 v1 vector plus m2 v2 vector. After collision, the momentum was the two particles stuck together. That's a single object which has the total mass, the sum of the masses of two particles, and some unknown final velocity vector v, which we have to find. We have to find vector v, both its direction and its magnitude. That's the purpose of our calculations. Well, the basic physics law is written and the solution is here. We can easily find both the direction of vector v and its magnitude. The only thing remaining to be done is to carry out some simple calculations. Okay, let's do it. M1 is one gram, one gram. V2, V1 is 3i minus 2j plus mass 2 is 2 grams, so 2 grams times second velocity is 4j minus 6k. And finally, it will be the total mass, which will be one gram plus two grams, three grams, total mass is three, and unknown velocity v. Can we find v from this equation? Certainly. Do we have to convert grams into kilograms? Yes, you can convert, but it's not necessary here, because if you put grams here and the grams here and the grams here, grams will be cancelled in this equation. You don't need grams. You don't need to convert them in, into kilograms. Uh, <coughs> by the way, to convert grams into kilograms, you have to uh, multiply by 10 to the power of minus three. One gram is one, thou one thousandth part of a kilogram. So by multiplying this equation uh, using the same coefficient, that will cancel anyway. So what we have here, three i minus two j plus two times four, eight j minus two times six, 12 k equals three B. We have two terms which may be combined. 8 minus 2 will give us 6g. And also we may divide this equation by this coefficient, by 3. What we obtain, 3 divided by 3, just one vector i plus 6 divided by 3, 2j, minus 12 divided by 3, 4k. That will be equal to vector v. So we have found vector v as expressed through unit vectors i, j, k. 
And that's the final answer to this problem for the vector. The only thing remaining to be done here is to find the modulus of the vector v. The modulus of vector v. We have found its direction. And now we also need to find its modulus. The modulus of vector, if vector v is given in general form, like <coughs> vx i plus v y j plus v z k, then the modulus of vector v will be given by a Pythagorean theorem as vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. Using this Pythagorean theorem, we just have to take these three coefficients squared here. That will be 1 plus 2 squared is 4 plus 4 squared is 16. So that will be square root of 21. That's enough. That's the modulus of our velocity. The length of this vector in the units which have been chosen here. That will be, if this is in international system, I told you this is three met meters per second, two meters per second, then here we will obtain a square root of 21 meters per second. Certainly, the, the modulus of velocity will be measured in meters per second. Any questions? Everything's clear? Will you be able to solve similar similar problem at the exam or at the written test? Um, problems offered to student at the written test. Um, maybe somewhat more complicated than that, because this problem is solved by a single law of physics. Just a single equation solves, uh, solves, uh, can solve this problem. At the written test and at the written exam, you will be given problems which require two or more laws of physics. For example, not only the law of conservation of momentum, but also some other law like conservation of energy or a law of uh, universal gravitation, Newton's law of gravitation. And so the problems given offered to students at the written test will be just a little bit more complicated. They will require usage of two or more physics laws. But if you, can, if you can use each physics law, if you understand how to use it, that will, that will pose no difficulty. Okay? We have considered two problems from your uh, home assignment. And the next problem uh, will be one eighty. Find the law according to which the mass of the rocket varies with time when the rocket moves with a constant acceleration. So acceleration is given. I will denote acceleration by A. That's given. The external forces are absent. So external forces are zero. 
And the gas escapes with a constant velocity u, which is also given constant velocity of gas relative to the rocket. And its mass at the initial moment equals m0. The initial mass of the rocket is given. And we have to find in this problem the law according to which the mass of the rocket changes. So we have to find this function, the mass of the rocket, as a function of time. If uh, the initial mass at time equals zero is given as m0. What does it mean that the external forces are zero? It means that the rocket flies somewhere far from the Earth. The forces of gravity do not act, or they are so small that we can neglect these forces. Very small forces of gravity. It means that the rocket is far from the Earth, and far from the Moon, and far from other planets. And we may consider all the external forces we may neglect all the external forces because they are very small, or we may put them as zero. <clears throat> it means that the rocket is somewhere in outer space, and it, and it wants to move with constant acceleration if the gas velocity is constant and the initial mass of the rocket is given, and we need to find what must be the function uh, of time, the mass of the rocket. How should, it, how should the mass of the rocket change with time in order for the acceleration to be constant in this particular case when the rocket is far from other bodies in outer space. Again, we need to use a Mishersky equation which is m dv by dt equal f. And I will use this, the form of this equation with the plus sign. Uh, with the plus sign, which means that I consider the mass, the changes of mass of the rocket. Not the amount of fuel, but the change in the rocket mass. So, we know the law of physics which must be used to solve this problem. The law that describes the motion of a body with variable mass. Let's solve it. What is known? We know from the statement that the force, external net force, is zero. So this term is zero. It's much easier to solve it. We know that the acceleration, which is dv dt, is constant. This vector is constant. The rocket moves with constant acceleration. So, we can write this equation in the following form. Ma, like just constant quantity, equals vector u dm dt. dm is the change of mass of the rocket. Certainly, we know that the velocity of gears with respect to the rocket has opposite direction to the acceleration of the rocket. If the gas is thrown in one direction, the rocket accelerates in opposite direction. So these two vectors are directed oppositely. So if I go from vector form to scalar form, I will write it down like minus u, because this vector is directed oppositely to the, to the acceleration. dm dt. I have to solve this differential equation. Such equation is called differential because we have a derivative of unknown function m. 
m is an unknown function of time. We don't know this function, and we have to find this function. How the mass of the rocket depends on time. We have to, we have to calculate to find this function. This is the function m of t. This is m of t. And this is the derivative of this function with respect to time. We don't know this function, we have to find it. Such an equation is called a differential equation. And there are many different ways of solution of different types of differential equations. And this simple form of differential equation can be solved easily by multiplying the equation by dt and dividing by m. That is by separating the variables. We separate the variables. We have one unknown function m and t is also varying. T is variable, independent variable. And we separate this variable. Everything related to time should be in one side of the equation. A dt, I multiply the equation by dt. And everything related to mass should be in another side of the equation. That will be minus u dm divided by am. This is the unknown function. I divided all the equation by m. The m will be here in denominator, and I multiply the, this equation by dt. The dt will appear here. So I have separated the variables. Everything related to one variable is in one side of the equation, and everything related to another unknown variable, which is unknown function, is in the other side of the equation. We have separated them. Now, after this procedure of separating, we can integrate it. A is constant. It can be written as a, a coefficient before the integral. U is constant, and we have to integrate it in this way. Integrating dt, we obtain t equals minus u, and integrating dm over am is logarithm am and plus unknown constant of integration, unknown integration constant. This constant can be easily found from the initial conditions given in this problem. We know that when time was zero, the mass of the rocket was m zero. So if time was zero, this is zero, the mass of the rocket is given at this particular time. So this is m zero plus the same constant. From here, we can find the constant. The constant is surely u logarithm m zero. We have found it from the second equation, which represents the initial conditions given in the problem. At the initial moment of time, which is zero, the mass of the rocket was given. It's m zero. And the same equation should hold at the initial moment of time and at any moment of time, at any time, starting from zero to any further moment of time. So we have found C from this condition, and now we, we can return to the initial equation, and uh, we can write that AT equals minus U. Uh, U is a factor. We can factor U here and obtain logarithm M of T plus logarithm m0. Hey, something's not, not correct. If this, is, if this is, I have missed a minus sign here. If I, if I put, if I factor minus u, then the first term inside the brackets with, will be with plus sign and the second term must be with minus sign because the constant is plus u. And in order to obtain this plus u, I have to multiply minus by minus. Then I will, I will have the correct value for, this, for the c constant. So that's it. 
certainly this will be u logarithm initial mass minus logarithm mass at any at any time moment and that will be u logarithm of the ratio of masses initial mass divided by m of t Any questions? Is everything clear up to this point? And now we have to find m of t from this equation. So this is just a t. And from this equation, we have to find the unknown function m of t. How can we do it? So if logarithm of something is equal to a t, then this something which is under the sign of logarithm can be expressed as exponent a t divided by u. We divided this equation by u. So in the left hand side of this equation we obtain a t divided by u equal to logarithm. It means that anything under the sign of logarithm may be expressed as exponent. Why so? Because of the definition of logarithm. Logarithm is such a function which by definition gives you this equation. We need to find m of t here. Let's do it. m of t here will be equal to m0 divided by exponent and that is e to the power of minus a t divided by u. M t. I must multiply this equation by m t and divide it by exponent, by an exponent. So when I divide it by an exponent, I obtain the minus sign here. This is the sort function. The mass of the rocket must change in time according to this function in order for the acceleration to be constant. The acceleration of the rocket must be constant. So this function, this m of t as a function of time is an exponent And the initial mass when time is zero is m0, and then it changes according to the exponent a t divided by u. This characteristic time, when a t divided by u equal to unity, we obtain that this happen at the time moment when a t equals u. That is t equal some characteristic time t0 equals u divided by a. So this point will be m0 divided by e. e is the base of natural logarithm. So the mass of the rocket should change in this way. And what should be the 
fuel consumption rate. That is the rate of change of the mass of the rocket. So it's easy to find the, the rate of change of the mass of the rocket. We have to take a derivative of this function. That will be minus m zero a t divided by u, exponent minus a t divided by u. That will be the rate of fuel consumption. How many kilograms of fuel spent? That's not really the rate of human con uh, fuel consumption. This is the rate of change of the rocket mass, which is negative because uh, because the rocket mass is decreasing, because the rocket is uh, spending fuel and its mass is decreasing at such a rate. So, if you want the rocket to move with constant acceleration, you must arrange for the fuel consumption to be a complicated function of time, an exponent which is expressed by an exponent of time. So you must, you must spend more fuel at the beginning, and then as the mass of the rocket decreases, the fuel consumption rate should also decrease. It will decrease due to this. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. When you take the derivative, you don't have to put T here. That's it, certainly. <laughs> Certainly, that's a mistake, because I, I take a derivative with respect to time. I have to take this coefficient as a factor before the expo at the exponent. <clears throat> so the fuel consumption will be maximum at the initial moment of time when time is zero, and then fuel consumption will diminish exponentially in time, so that the acceleration remains constant. We need to diminish the fuel consumption with time because the mass of the rocket diminishes. It. You don't need to spend much fuel to accelerate uh, the rocket, which, is, which becomes lighter and lighter, the smaller and smaller mass. You need smaller and smaller fuel consumption to, to have the same acceleration for, of smaller mass of the rocket. That's it. Everything is quite understandable. Any questions? No question? No questions? Everything's clear? I'm trying to give you a detailed solution of every problem so that you understand every little step in solution. Certainly the same should be done whenever you solve yourself any problem. Never try to, uh, to guess and to skip some logical steps. Every logical step should be understood clearly whenever you solve a problem. Next, I would like to consider an interesting issue of interstellar communication, interstellar travel. What if we would like to travel to a nearby star? We can travel to moon, we, we can send uh, spaceships to Mars and other planets in the solar system, but what if we would like to, what if we want to send a spaceship to a nearby star? The nearest star is about four light years from the sun. So it takes four years 
it takes four years for light to travel from the sun to the nearest star. And light travels with the velocity of light, which is approximately 300,000 kilometers per second. That is three times 10 to the power of five kilometers per second. That is the speed of light. And when light moves with such a speed, at, at such speed, it can travel to the nearest star in about four years, just, just about four years, maybe slightly more. So the nearest star is very far away from, from the sun. The light goes there during four years. So if we send there a spaceship or some uh, automatic probe, we must, we must travel, the spaceship must travel with high velocity if we want to, uh, to see it ever returning backward. Or if we want to, find, if we want to receive a radio signal from it, uh, giving us information about the nearest star. So this distance should be covered within a reasonable time. It should not be 1,000 years. No, nobody would like to wait for 1,000 years. We would like to wait for, well, maybe 40 years. 40 years, 40 years <laughs> is something um, which is acceptable. Like we, we may hope, well, young people will hope to to live up to this point when, when they will receive a radio signal from the spaceship. So in order to cover the distance to the nearest star in 40 years, the spaceship must travel at the velocity 10% of the velocity of speed, uh, uh, at the speed of light. So the velocity of the spaceship should be about c over 10. If the velocity goes just at one-tenth of the velocity of light, then it will take 10, 10 times more for the spaceship to reach the uh, nearest star than the light. The light goes there in four years, and the spaceship will, it will take 40 years for the spaceship to go there. So the spaceship should move with approximately this velocity to the star. And according to Tsiolkovsky formula, this velocity is the velocity of gas ejected by the rocket, logarithm, initial mass, and final mass. It may be put as, what is the initial mass? This is the mass of the rocket itself, of the spacecraft itself, plus the mass of the fuel when the rocket is filled with fuel. And the, initial, and the final mass will be just the mass of the uh, spacecraft without the fuel. So this capital M is the mass of the fuel, which, which we need to travel, uh, to travel to accelerate the rocket to such a high speed. And my purpose is to calculate how much, how much fuel do I need in order to accelerate the rocket up to this velocity. This velocity is 10 times less than the velocity of light, so we don't need to use uh, relativistic formulas. It's quite enough to use classical formulas because the velocity is still much smaller than the velocity of light. We would need relativistic formulas when we move at the velocities close to the velocity of light. But if you have just one tenth of the velocity of light, you may use, with good approximation, you may use uh, classical physics, not relativistic. Okay, so one-tenth of the velocity of light is about, yes, it's three times 10 to the power of four kilometers per second. That will be the final velocity of our spaceship and the velocity u, the chemical reactions used in fuel, can produce velocities up to five kilometers per second, even less. 
this is the upper limit for the velocities in chemical in chemical fuel. Actually, the velocity is slight; it's just just somewhat less than that. But we put it as maximum possible, which can be taken from, which can be achieved when we when we use uh, chemical reactions, chemical fuel. And then we have a logarithm of small m plus capital M, the mass of the fuel divided by small m. And I have to find the mass, uh, I have to estimate the mass of the fuel which I will need in such a flight, an interstellar flight. Okay, kilometers per second here and kilometers per second here will cancel and three, uh, uh, that is 30,000 divided by five will give you 6,000 and that will be logarithm and I will divide nominator and denominator by m and I will obtain one plus capital M divided by small m. And so this quantity one divided one plus capital M divided by small m will be equal to an exponent of six and ten to the power of three. This is a huge number, incredibly huge number, such that the unity can be cancelled here, we can neglect it, it's, it plays no role at all. So m divided, capital M divided by the mass of the probe, space probe, will be approximately equal to an exponent, six times 1,000. That is the ratio of the fuel mass and the space probe mass, which will fly without fuel, empty rocket and the fuel. That's very reasonable. I can find the ratio of the required fuel mass. This is certainly larger than the exponent just in uh, 1000. So I take away this 6 and I understand that if I, if I take this away I will obtain the number much smaller. And this is certainly much much greater than the exponent of 100. Here I have the exponent of 1000 and here 100. Certainly, if I, if I take e, e uh, to the power of 1000, that will be much, much greater. I will even use this sign to, to indicate that this is much, much greater than e to the power of 100. How do we call this number e to the power of 100? Do you know there is a special name for this? There is a special name for this number. This is what? One Google. This is one Google. This number is called one Google. And this name was used uh, used to name the search engine Google, the well-known internet search engine. They just used this number uh, to name the search engine. So this is one Google. And uh, this number is so huge that it's believed to be approximately equal to the number of atoms in the universe. That is approximately, and even more than the number of atoms in the universe. The number of atoms, the number of atoms in the universe is approximately believed to be 10 to the power of 89, something like that. And e to the power of 100, well, approximately, approximately, it, even more than the number of atoms in the universe. So if we want to send to the nearest star the mass of the space probe, 
having the mass of one atom. This is just one atom. Then the mass of the fuel will be more than the mass of the universe. Should be more than the mass of the universe. Is that real? Can we produce that amount of fuel? The mass of which equals the mass of the universe? No, certainly not. This is absolutely unreal. So, it's absolutely impossible to travel to a nearby star if we want to use a chemical fuel with such a low velocity of gas injection as five kilometers per second. Chemical fuel is absolutely inappropriate for this purpose. We can use chemical fuel to travel to the moon, to nearby planets within the solar system, but we, if we would ever like to travel to a nearby star, the chemical fuel is out of the question. Because you will need the mass of the chemical fuel much more than the mass of the universe in this particular case. So if you want to travel to a nearby star, star you will have to choose some other type of fuel which gives you much higher velocity of ejection of gases, much higher velocity. You need to, you need to, to increase this coefficient in order to decrease this number so that the mass of the fuel becomes reasonable and acceptable. That's it. That's about the travel to stars. What kind of engine, what kind of rocket engine can it be if not, if not chemical fuel, if not based on chemical agents, then what can it be? It may be some nuclear engine or some other type of engines. Well, in scientific fiction, you can find the description of all types of future possible engines. And uh, we have still some time to consider another problem. I would like to consider a problem, uh -huh, this one. It's not from your home assignment, but it's an interesting problem. Suppose we have a mass M1 which travels at some unknown velocity, but that's denoted by V1. And uh, there is another mass, another block of mass M2, which is at rest. The velocity of this second body is zero, which is at rest. And there is no friction. There is no friction. There is certainly some surface along which these bodies can slide without friction. So ideal situation for the law of conservation of momentum. It's known that after the perfectly elastic impact, after the perfectly elastic collision, these two bodies, M1 and M2, move with equal velocities, like V and V, equal velocities. And we have to find in this problem the ratio of masses, M2 over M1. We have to find this number, the ratio of two masses. How much is the second mass if compared to the first one? So the second body was at rest when the first body collided with it at some unknown velocity, but it's known that after the collision both masses go apart 
with equal velocities, also unknown. We don't know, these velocities are not given. Practically no numbers are given in this problem. The initial velocity is not given, the masses are unknown, the final velocities are not given. What is known that the final velocities were equal, the same in magnitude, certainly oppositely directed, but the same in magnitude. And we have to find the ratio of masses. Which law of physics can be used here? Certainly, the law of conservation of momentum, and also we can use uh, a theorem on the motion of the center of mass. The center of mass of these two bodies, let's denote it here by point C, moves at some velocity because this is moving and the second body does not move. The first body moves and the second does not move. So the center of mass is somewhere in between, somewhere in the middle between them. And it's, it moves with some velocity. I don't know what is this velocity. Let's denote it by Vc, the velocity of the center of mass. And the theorem on the motion of the center of mass tells us that the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass is what? The net external force. In our case, the net external force is zero. Only the internal force is present here, the force of interaction between these two bodies at the moment when they collide. When they touch each other, then there is a force of interaction. Otherwise, there is no forces, no forces acting on these bodies. So the external, net external force is zero acting on the system. And therefore, the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. It means that the vector of velocity of the center of mass is constant. And it means that the center of mass moves at the same velocity before the collision and after the collision. The center of mass keeps keeps moving at this velocity, which is constant. It doesn't change because there, there are only internal forces. Okay, how can we, how can we calculate this velocity of the center of mass? I, I use the scalar form of this equation because it's easy to go from vector form to scalar form because we know the direction of every vector here. So the velocity of the center of mass is the velocity of the first body before the collision times its mass plus the velocity of the second body, which is zero. So the second term here will be zero. We know from the very beginning because it's given that the second body was not moving, divided by the total mass two bodies. Total mass, capital M, I will denote it as equal to M1 plus M2. So the velocity of the movement of the center of mass is M1 divided by total mass V1. And that will be the same velocity uh, after the collision as it was before the collision. How can we calculate the velocity of the center of mass after the collision? After the collision, we have this picture, this sketch, and the same velocity, the same, it doesn't change, after the collision will be M1, V directed to the left, so that will be taken with minus sign, plus M2, the same velocity V, the velocity is given, is known as the same, the two masses after the collision have the same velocity, divided by total mass. And this is equal to uh, already known expression M1 divided by capital M 
V1. In this equation, we can cancel capital M and we can divide this equation by M1 and we will obtain M2 divided by M1 M2 divided by M1 minus 1 times velocity equal to I divided everything by M1 and multiplied by capital M so here we will have just V1 I cancel capital M and divide all the equation by M1 so it will disappear here and disappear here we will have minus one yes it's correct can we find the unknown quantity the ratio of masses from this equation no because we don't know the ratio of these two velocities we have to find we have to find it somehow v1 divided by v if we knew this ratio then we could certainly find the unknown quantity which I denoted by x so in this problem I have to use some other condition in order to find the unknown relationship between these two velocities in order to solve the problem which condition should be used I have already used uh, the velocity, the, uh, the fact that the center of mass moves, moves cons with constant velocity. Uh, <clears throat> I, have used, I have already made use of this condition. What else can be used here? Sorry? Oh, no. Yes, yes, you can use energy because a conservation of kinetic energy because the collision is absolutely elastic. But in this particular problem, we can use only uh, conservation of momentum and nothing more. And another trick, and another trick in this problem. Another trick consists in consideration of all the events in a different reference frame. I just give you a hint. If you go to a reference frame, associated with the center of mass then you can use again all the same ideas but in a different reference frame in this reference frame the velocity of center of mass is zero because we are in this uh, frame of reference and the velocities of these bodies can be found somehow denoted somehow and the final velocities can also be found expressed in the same way just in different reference frame and then this, key, this will give you the possibility to find the relationship between V and V1. And this will give you the possibility to find this unknown quantity. Unfortunately, we have the, this is the end of our lesson. And I hope you could finish the solution of this problem at home. Uh, some, I will ask some of you to solve this problem either at the exam or at the defense of your home assignment. So please finish this solution. I gave you the main idea. I gave you the hint how to find, how to solve this problem. So finish it at home and this will be the end of this class. Thank you.